10 deals starting the fourth series of lectures of our school. So uh, Sebastian Deal is a theoretician that has a unique style of solving problems. He has a very advanced field theoretical technique suited for non-equilibrium systems that basically no one else or very few other people now master at this level in the world. So you're going to hear stuff that is very, let's say, different from the typical theory class. And just to give you a uh, very coordinate, Sebastian studied in Germany, did his PhD in Heidelberg with Christoph Wetterich. And after five years of postdoc, at the age of 35, he got his call as full professor. And since then, he's essentially a European leader. Uh, in our continent, he got an ERC consolidator that is a huge amount of money that typical experimental groups get. He got it for theory. So this is a clear signature that what he's doing is leaving a fingerprint in our community. And today is going to give you an essay of his techniques. He's basically rewriting all the equilibrium statistical mechanics in a new field theoretical languages that encompasses more standard non-equilibrium phenomena up to more recent problems on many body entanglement. And I'm pretty sure that in 50, 60 years, maybe some of this stuff will stay in books and will remain knowledge of humanity. So please, Sebastian. <laughs> OK, thank you, Jamie. Yes, so these words are very warm so that I have to <laughs> directly <laughs> drink it. <laughs> mm. Right, yeah, so thank you very much for the introduction, and um, yeah, it's, it's great to be here. I'm looking forward to hopefully really active lectures. Uh, it will be on uh, driven open quantum systems, yeah, where the specifically new feature compared to quantum optics will be the presence of many degrees of freedom, thermodynamically many degrees of freedom. And let me start uh, right away with uh, the lecture outline. So um, the first two lectures, yeah, so that's, that's kind of a package uh, which will give you some theoretical background and then also some applications where for the theoretical background, yeah, the main conceptual step that we'll do today yeah, is to uh, transform the Lindblad equation that, uh, as I understand, you got to know uh, last week, transform this into a functional integral language, yeah, a Lindblad Keldish functional integral, and then I will elaborate on a few structural aspects of this theoretical framework. For example, we'll uh, take a semi-classical limit and connect this physics to um, Langevin to, to the physics of exciton polariton systems and to the technology of Langevin equations. I will also uh, take some time to really uh, define yeah, and to make it precise yeah, in which systems, uh, in which sense these systems are really systems that are manifestly taken out of equilibrium. And then with this knowledge in the back of our minds, we can apply this in one example, for example, studying the uh, fate of uh, the um, famous berzinski kostelitz taulis transition, a uh, hallmark of a topological transition in two dimensions, uh, to see what the fate of this is under these non-equilibrium conditions and even encounter a phase transition that is driven purely by pushing the system farther and farther out of its equilibrium stationary state. And then in the third lecture, so, so this uh, part here relies on this semi-classical limit here in the third lecture that I, I leave it open at the moment. We see how far we get. I could either um, discuss more the physics of pure states in, uh, in out of equilibrium systems and their um, relation to topological states of matter or, um, and I will also ask you for advice then, um, address this topic that Jamir already anticipated about uh, measurements, yeah, which is also a kind of interesting development where we are addressing the physics of pure states in an out of equilibrium context. And let me make it very clear, yeah, so these are obviously your lectures. And um, I uh, would, again, ask you yeah, to interrupt me whenever anything is unclear and uh, just make use of this. And I really don't care yeah, if, if we miss out on, on parts of it, especially this part in the middle. I can either do it in an extended way or in a pretty abridged way. So um, take, keep this in mind. We have no time pressure. We just go with the flow. Okay, so um, last week you got to know 
the Lindblad equation. I will take maybe some 10 minutes, depending on your questions, yeah, to refresh this a little bit and to frame it in the language that then gives us, so to say, the, uh, um, the step stone for uh, mapping it into a um, path integral formulation. So very basic, yeah, and you've seen the system before. Yeah, so what is actually a, a driven open quantum system? Yeah, so let's fix the important conceptual ingredients for that. You have a small quantum system here, which is immersed into a environment, a dissipative environment. That's where this open notion comes from. And open means that this small quantum system can exchange various quantities with its environment. Let that be particle number, let it be energy, or just entropy information between the two subsystems yeah, of this huge global system here. And the second important ingredient, so that where is something that you have in condensed matter as well, yeah, so electrons are coupled to a phonon bath. The special feature we are dealing with here, and that is what will take the system really away from thermal equilibrium, is the fact that it's driven. Yeah? And um, that could be, for example, done by a laser, and indeed, yeah, here is our uh, unit cell for a driven open quantum system that was also discussed by, by Hannes. Yeah? It's just uh, the simple most paradigmatic example is really this uh, driven um, two-level system. So we have a ground and an excited state. Um, and uh, we have here a laser which operates at a frequency nu that almost bridges the distance between these levels, but not quite. So you can dial in some detuning by choosing the laser frequency. And the uh, laser intensity is proportional to this uh, omega here that we have. And then, so this is what makes the system driven. Yeah? So this is our laser drive. And um, there is also an effect that was not discussed now, but that's a kind of deep quantum effect in a sense. Yeah? Coupling to the radiation field leads to the possibility to spontaneously emit light at some rate kappa. So this is a super simple system, but it really has, a tell, has to tell you a lot about uh, um, driven open quantum systems. Yeah? A very simple fact is that the drive is essential to bridge the energy distance here and to finally reach, starting from a ground state of this atom, the excited state, right? And that here has a lot of important consequences yeah, that you can see in this small unit cell and that we will explore in a many particle context. But here are already some keywords. Maybe you keep them in mind. So first of all, there is no minimization of energy really in this problem. Yeah? So we are driving this. We are pumping in energy all the time. So the, the system is not uh, looking for its ground state here. There's also no guarantee for what is known as detailed balance, which would mean the probabilities for occupying two states in a system is given by just the energetic distance between these levels, which would be the distance between excited and ground state. And you can see just by counting scales in this problem, yeah, there's many more dimensionful quantities like this drive, this uh, intensity, or dimension energy quantities, which certainly are more than just the separation between these energy levels. Mm -hmm. So no guarantee for detailed balance in this problem. Yes. Uh, yeah, so uh, do you consider a closed system here with driving, like for this two-level system, or...? Uh... No, we, we really have, I mean, uh, this is this, this scale kappa in the problem, that is the spontaneous emission. So, so okay. that's a, in that sense open, yeah, by open, the, the environment in this case is the radiation field around. Yeah. Okay, but, but then like, why wouldn't there be... So if there was, if there was no driving, right? Yeah. So only under this specific model of like spontaneous emission, there would be no excess of excited state, because otherwise I can imagine that we might have an open system, right? And you just, you know, within your subsystem, you just like absorb the energy from outside, right? And, but like within this model, you can only emit the energy from the system, and that's why you cannot access. Oh, you mean there is no spontaneous absorption? Yeah, yeah. yeah. That that is a question of of scales. Yeah. Mm. So for to there is in principle spontaneous absorption. Yeah. So there's always any process comes with its with its reverse. The underlying universe model is Hamiltonian. Yeah. Mm. But um, <laughs> now we have scales come in, and we have to compare 
the separation of these levels is to the temperature of the radiation field, yeah? say 3 Kelvin, <laughs> background radiation. And the typical um, energy scales, yeah, of, uh, I mean, of, of the level spacing is, is really in the, in the terahertz, yeah? and that compares to, I mean, it's a factor of 1,000. Mm. Yeah? And, and, and the f spontaneous absorption is suppressed by a factor of 1,000 compared to the, um, uh, to the, uh, to the spontaneous emission. Yeah. So it's only a quantitative thing. Okay, perfect. Thanks. Right. So, and, and then uh, another aspect, yeah, so that, that we would discuss it in more detail if we go for this option of pure states, yeah, is that there is for this small quantum system here in the middle, there is no uh, obedience of the second law of, uh, of thermodynamics. Yeah? So in principle, of course, the global system will always is increase its entropy, but because we drive this smaller system and only the entropy of the total system grows, there's no um, guarantee that the entropy in the subsystem grows, and that's actually neat. Yeah? Because we can think of building quantum fridges. Yeah? We can transfer entropy maybe from the small quantum system to the dissipative uh, environment. Okay, so these are three basic effects. And now let's think about how we uh, describe this physics. Uh, yeah, oh, the pointer is, is still active. And that is done by this um, quantum master or Lindblad equation. Mm -hmm. So let's go through it again quickly. So here we have the time evolution really of the system density matrix, which is generated by a Heisenberg commutator here. So this describes the coherent evolution of the system Hamiltonian that's going in here. And then we have this dissipative structure here. These Li's are called the Lindblad operators. I think you've seen them. And this index here can run over whatever for example, it might label the sides of a lattice system. It might label the spin degree of freedom. So it's a pretty uh, general index. And these L operators here, they describe really how the system is coupled to the bath. And then one integrates out the bath to get this uh, driven dissipative evolution. And this whole thing here is referred to as the Lindbladian operator. Now there's actually two, just very quickly, two ways to derive this equation. One is good if you're interested in actual scales, in validity of approximations, and then you would start from a concrete system and bath setting. Yeah? So you would mo choose a model for this environment here. For example, a collection of harmonic oscillators. You have a Hamiltonian within the system, and then you have a system bath coupling, where here you can see these Lindblad operators um, showing up, and they are lin linearly coupled to the bath operators. Now, just to make it concrete, for, for this example of a two-level system, that would be the system Hamiltonian. The Lindblad operators would be just, I mean, if we only consider spontaneous emission, would be just a conversion from the excited to the ground state, and that goes via the emission of um, Fo uh, photons here, and the coupling strength here, this g mu nu, that's really the strength of coupling the, the system to the bath. Okay, and there's then three approximations, I guess. Uh, did you walk through these approximations? Yes, very good. Yeah, so that it's, um, there's a weak system bath coupling, so that means the bath is unaffected by the system. There's a Markov approximation. Um, actually, need my glasses here. I can't read my own slides. <laughs> So um, there's a Markov approximation uh, that tells you the um, system evolution is co slow compared to the bath, and that gives rise to this time local structure of the evolution. Yeah? So on both sides, we have rho on t and no memory that goes back into the past. And there's a rotating wave approximation, which tells you that uh, some of the drive selects uh, relevant energy regimes. Okay, there is another point of view, and that is what gave it the name of, uh, of Lindblad, yeah? a, a totally different point of view which leads to the same result, and that's actually more based on symmetry. Yeah? So you look for what are the principles that govern the update of a state of a quantum density matrix. Yeah? So the object with which we describe general mixed quantum states, and that and, and you can look at this Lindblad operator here as a dynamical map. Yeah? 
meaning that I have a density matrix that transforms under a time step delta t into basically nothing happens. Yeah? So there's a unit matrix on rho on t, plus then an update, which is proportional to the small uh, time increment, which is governed by this Lindblad operator. And again, it's not the main topic here, but uh, just, to, um, just to tell you, um, the, um, the dynamical map with three properties here uniquely fixes this Lindblad generator here, and these structural properties that we require for a density matrix to evol evolve under, uh, in, in time is that it remains Hermitian. Yeah? So after the update with this generator of dynamics, this L operator here, the density matrix is supposed to remain Hermitian. And that is, you can verify this by just checking that if you apply the Hermitian conjugation to this whole uh, L operator here, it really remains Hermitian, the, the updated density matrix, so this thing here. And it's also a, a, a completely positive map. Don't, ma uh, don't um, care too much about this complete positivity, but positivity is that um, the density matrix here, when you start with a positive or non, with a density matrix which has uh, non-negative eigenvalues, then under the update by this Lindblad operator here, it preserves this property. Yeah? So a meaningful non-negative density matrix is mapped into another um, new density matrix. The um, Physically, the gamma i here, that's, that's very good. Yeah? I actually, I forgot to mention that. The gamma i's are the uh, strength of decay rates. It's the strength of the um, dissipative processes that act in this system. Uh, it has a dimension of energy, yeah, for, um, and it describes you yeah, so how fast the decay is out of the system. I mean, we, we'll come to this in an example. Okay, um, and that the third property that you would like to, to have is, thank you, yeah, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, the, the, the last property that we need is the preservation of trace. Yeah? So the time evolution um, of the trace of rho of t is actually trivial, and that fol follows yeah, from the cyclicity of the trace operation. Yeah? So if you take this whole thing here under the trace, yeah, you, um, and you use that under the trace. So is this clear to everyone, just to gauge it? Good. So cyclicity of the trace, uh, you see that um, the, the actually we have trace preserved, or in other words, probability is preserved. Yeah? And, and then the statement that, that Lindblad could make here is actually that up to a unit trans unitary transformation in the space of this index i, yeah, you could rotate that, that read this as a diagonal form, yeah, where we are just really summing over diagonal, you could undo this to an arbitrary basis in the space of this index here, up to such a unitary, this um, is the most general time local update of a, a density matrix that you can encounter in quantum mechanics. Yes. So do we have some relation that like sum over, because like I'm just trying to figure out this trace being zero. Yeah. So like, is it that, there's like sum over i, li, li dagger or something gives you an identity or something, or like uh, basically so that? Hmm? It's, it's term by term, actually. Hmm. Hmm. So let's just look at trace. You can take out one of the gamma i's. Yeah? Maybe there's a two here. So that's how you can actually remember the two. And then we have... This thing, yeah. and now I commute this here, here, and this whole thing here, and you see for any i, this is zero. So also for the sum over it, okay? Good. Great. I, I like any question you, you want to ask. Eh? So <laughs> very good. Okay. So now let's come a bit to the interpretation of this equation. So um, 
And it comes yeah, when, when, you, uh, when you rearrange these terms in a little a different manner. Yeah? You see here this um, anti-commutator structure. Yeah? You ca I can just pull it together with a Hamiltonian. There's a minus i in front here, so I have to add another minus i in front so to pull it out. And then you see, oh, but this is just really how I would naively think about the energy in the system. And then I have some decay in this system. Yeah? And that, that's, I think that gives you, I mean, again, with respect to the question, that gives you an easy interpretation of this gamma. Really think of this maybe as something like Li dagger Li as, as the local density in this problem. Let L be just the creation or the annihilation operator. Then it's just L dagger L is just um, the, the local particle number. Yeah, so then this decays somehow proportional to the density in the system, yeah, and, and then you have an interpretation of this anti-commutator term here as the dissipation in the problem. And now we take really one of the most fundamental principles of physics, no matter quantum or classical, the, prob the preservation of, of total probability or quantum mechanics as expressed as the preservation of the norm of the state or the trace of a row. Yeah, and then you can remember that this term here really uh, ensures the probability conservation, which wouldn't be present if we just had this term here. Yeah? So, and this is, if, if we refer to this piece here as dissipation, yeah, that's decay, then we might refer to this as fluctuation yeah, that compensates for the loss of probability. And that's a nice way to remember actually this, this factor of two here. Yeah, you can also see it from this, uh, from this little calculation. Okay, very good. So, um, so far, the only model that I was looking at is really um, few degrees of freedom. Yeah? So there's two level system that we were looking at. And the question we want to explore in these lectures here is what if we actually replace now this few degrees of freedom by many degrees of freedom. And that will really bring us to this pretty recent interface of quantum optics and many body physics in the sense that the systems that we'll target here, they share with those, with the typical quantum optical system, yeah, that coherent Hamiltonian and driven dissipative Lindbladian evolution occur on an equal footing if you ignore one of these, yeah, you get screwed, you make an order one um, um, uh, error. But on the other hand, they we we'll want to look at systems that uh, share with many body physics that they have a continuum or an extensive thermodynamically large set of degrees of freedom. Yeah? And that's very different from typical quantum optical systems where you discuss the physics of single atoms or few atoms or so. Yeah? And this pretty unique and also rather recently available combination yeah, allows us to even ask questions that you're maybe familiar with from statistical mechanics, yeah? so about phase transitions, phases of matter, and so on. So, and um, let me tell you now where are typical instances of such systems. Yeah? So what are the experimental platforms that even allow us to, to do such a transition here? Um, the rule of thumb is whenever you couple light and matter pretty strongly to each other, then uh, you get a driven open quantum systems because you want, if you want to have a finite excitation, many body excitation density in the system, you need to replenish the decaying system that's due to the light component all the time. Yeah? So, and then you get a flux equilibrium state uh, that is a characteristic of a light matter system. So for example, in the context of atoms, yeah, so there is uh, these pioneering works at ETH where an entire Bose-Einstein condensate is, uh, is placed in an optical cavity. The light-matter interaction leads to the occupation not only of a single uh, quantum state macroscopically, but actually two of them. So this model maps then to a famous Dicke model and is one of the first, I would say, really strong light-matter uh, interaction systems that have been established. Also on the atom side, uh, there is um, Rydberg gases, not the ones that Hannes is discussing in a completely different regime later times, yeah, and, and um, atoms that are not uh, trapped in, in tweezers, but, but rather in a, in a big, big trap here. So uh, these systems also offer a lot of decay and have to be replenished all the time. Light 
dominant light, light dominated systems yeah, occur when you have these micro cavity arrays. So here you confine light into optical resonators. This light then gets pretty localized but can still tunnel between, um, between different resonators and that realizes uh, driven open variants of say Bose Hubbard models or in solids and that's something that I will discuss later on in a bit more detail here. This is super superficial, yeah, but, but this will go a little bit more in detail. And yeah, these exciton polariton systems where you have essentially a piece of semiconductor hosting these exciton excitations, particle hole pairs, yeah, which are also strongly coupled to light that is confined here into two other layers of, of uh, highly reflecting uh, semiconductor uh, physics. And another um, big arena for this physics here is really popping up in the context of um, NISC platforms, which even go in the direction of true quantum devices, yeah, where you can program, you have functional matter which you can locally manipulate and program. So in, this, um, in these superconducting circuits, for example, people have achieved a cooling or, or uh, establishing, generating the ground state of um, of, of, of a toric or surface code. This platform is what Hannes uh, is discussing, still, I guess, uh, Rydberg tweezers, and trapped ions also uh, go in the direction of bigger systems um, that, for example, realize this measurement induced phase transition physics. Yeah. To kill this line downstairs. Yeah. Okay. I think, I mean, it's, I don't need it, absolutely. Yeah, so if you don't fix it, uh, would be nice, but... Uh, <laughs> yeah. It's still there. But, uh, yeah, okay, now it's gone. Yeah. Great, thank you. Okay, so, so on, the, on the theory side, but now this thing is, ah, right, now this is gone. Okay, but I don't see the, the pointer anymore. <laughs> ah, now it's gone, whatever, <laughs> fluctuations. Mm -hmm. um, Right, yeah. so, so from the theory point of view, of course, we want to identify in this framework phenomena yeah, so that really a pinpoint that the system is um, microscopically driven out of equilibrium. Yeah? So what are the, the new phenomena that cannot happen in thermodynamic equilibrium? This piece here I will elaborate on uh, now in the following. Yeah, we need to, to find uh, tools to desc even describe these systems because we, we, are, we don't have any more a concept like a free energy, yeah? for example, something that we can minimize and do our calculations. We cannot use the standard functional integral of, of thermodynamic equilibrium, but we still are in, um, we want still uh, to find a way to perform the transition from the microscopic to the macroscopic physics in practice. Yeah? And at the same time, of course, this is an interplay with, uh, with experiments. Okay, so here, let me introduce a model that I will, yeah, question. Mm -hmm. So um, how many like degrees of freedom are you considering here? Is it like a photo of thousands, ten thousands? Like, uh, I mean, uh, th that's a nice, a nice question. I want to consider systems, let me uh, uh, answer it like that, where the limit n to infinity is better than the limit n equals ten. Yeah? So it's like uh, if you describe the desert, yeah, it's <laughs> certainly a 
not a true continuum, yeah, but if you want to understand how dunes move, move, yeah, so then the limit n to infinity, a continuum limit, is certainly the better description. And, and these are the systems that we have in mind. Yeah. We are specifically interested uh, in the phase structure, in the phase transitions. So this is a coarse-grained description yeah, where a continuum formulation is more appropriate than and then thinking about the discrete particles, similar to statistical mechanics. Yeah? We, are, we want to ask StatMec questions. However, in, in the absence of StatMec principles like uh, free energy minimization and so on. Mm. But like, and, and those experimental platforms, right? Like you have a few dozen oh. or like few hundred yeah, atoms, very right? Good, so yeah. mm -hmm. how do you, you know, like map on this? Like um, no, th that's a absolutely fair point. I mean, for example, what I like uh, is if you look at the uh, um, spectrum. Of, uh, of uh, 60 atoms forming a buckyball. Yeah? It's almost <laughs> indistinguishable from a, uh, from, a, from a perfect black body radiator. Yeah? So sometimes n equals 60 can be almost infinity. And of course, I mean, yeah, you have to make sure, for example, in these exciton polariton systems, that's really an excellent approximation. Yeah? And in, in cold atoms, yeah, also, I mean, for many many applications, this is a good, a good assumption, but it's a question that you have to check from case to case, yeah? mm. providing the techniques given these circumstances fulfilled. Yeah. Mm. So sorry, so just a yeah. final question on this. So, so then would you expect like some, I don't know, some finite size numerics like, I don't know, DMRG or like methods like that to give you like similar results to what you're about to derive or? Uh, Sure. I mean, <laughs> if the systems are, are big enough, I mean, so mm. the, the system size is always a highly non-universal question. Mm. Yeah? So, I mean, I, I think that I, I cannot give a, a, a global answer to that. Uh, that's more or less a kind of, of knob that you, that you can tune and, and convince yourself whether or not you, you see phenomena of this type. Yeah? Yeah. Cool. Thanks. It, it, there's not only a DMRG. Yeah? So, so, I mean, many of the things we are discussing here have been actually also numerically verified. It, it doesn't have to be with DMRG, but with other techniques. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> okay, more questions. Okay, so let, let's look at the generic uh, microscopic uh, many, body, many body model, and that I would refer to this as Lindblad Phi 4 theory. Yeah? And that is, uh, if we look at it in the, in the, um, in the uh, Lindblad framework, yeah, the, the main, this Hamiltonian here for the system is really uh, consists of kinetic energy, um, there is a, a, a chemical potential, yeah? And, uh, or a, just a constant term in the single particle Hamiltonian, and then there is a two particle interaction. Now I didn't didn't get the question quite. Can anyone can you repeat this? While uh, repeating this, I mean I continue to define. Where is the question? Oh. Or you want to read it maybe? Yeah. Are the equivalent? Yeah. Right, yeah. I mean, I, I was pointing out two different ways to derive the same thing with the idea so, so that in, indeed, I mean, one is uh, the technique yeah, with this explicit system bar setting is the technique that allows you to see if your approximations are correct and in the other, in the symmetry-based way, you are asking yourself, so, or you pose yourself the question, what is the most general time local update that a density matrix can undergo? The answer is this Lindblad generator. That, of course, doesn't tell you anything about the validity of this approximation. It's a theoretical question. The other, the system bath setting based derivation, this is the one that allows you to judge yeah, whether, for example, this Born approximation, weak system bath coupling is something that you should apply, whether um, the, the um, Markov approximation, yeah, so the, the time local approximation is, is something that you should apply. And that is, again, something that you have to check case by case. Okay, very good. Other questions? Yeah. And how the time local as aspect deals with phenomena such as entanglement and non-Markovian dynamics, for instance? 
non-Markovian, I mean, kind of by definition, <laughs> is, is not covered in this way. What you can do, I mean, actually, I'm deriving this Keldish yeah, from, the, um, from the Lindblad equation with the reasoning, yeah, so that to me this is a kind of minimal and indeed symmetry-based model to describe the structure of driven open system. In the Keldish framework, it is very easy and it goes under the name of feynman bernon functional integral yeah, to implement also baths which have a memory over time and which give you non-Markovian uh, actions in, in no time. Yeah? So it's totally possible. Yeah? Um, there's also good reasons, maybe I, I shouldn't go into the details, but to think about systems in their ground states yeah, when it comes to dynamics as highly non-Markovian systems. Yeah, the, the noise level in these systems is everything but delta correlated, which would be Markovian. It's actually long-ranged in time. So in that sense, ground state dynamics in ground states is highly non-Markovian physics. All that can be dealt with in this, uh, in this path integral. I mean, I just choose this path yeah, also to connect it to something that, I mean, many systems, conversely, yeah, one should say that many f systems fall into this class. Okay. And one reason is that, I mean, if you look at systems in a time coarse grained way, yeah, so then, I mean, the dynamics of bath degrees of freedom is often very much faster than your coarse-grained system degrees of freedom, and that is a physical justification also for working in this setup, which is very often realized in okay. systems. So cool, thanks. Yeah. More questions? Okay, so, right, back to the model. So here we have a Hamiltonian kinetic energy and uh, two-body interaction, that's our many-body system Hamiltonian. And notice now we have an index i, yeah, which is realized by a spatial continuum index. Yeah? So we are summing over all positions in this problem. And in this case, yeah, the, the gamma, uh, all these rates here, yeah, they are independent on position because we have a translation invariant system. So that connects actually to this uh, formulation down there. And here we have one process is a single particle pumping. Yeah? So here you can see a particle is created onto that state yeah? and here it, it respects the Lindblad structure. We have a, <laughs> a single particle loss if it comes out. A single particle loss term which is um, um, where you can see here the deletion of a particle on the state. And to complete our Lindblad phi-fourth model, yeah, we want something that is just as quartic as the elastic collisions. We add some two particle losses onto this problem. Yeah? You can see two particles here are lost in one space uh, point here at a time. Yeah? So that pairs up with this quartic term. Yeah? So there's a, a two-body collisions and there's two-body losses here. So that makes our Lindblad 5-4. Yes. Question. But so here you're considering an incoherent pump, or yes. am I wrong? Okay, yeah. but not coherent. Not a coherent pump. I mean, one reason for that is on the uh, next. Nah. Ah, there is some. <laughs> there is some little stiffness. The reason is that I want in this uh, problem. I want to think about uh, condensation in the sense of spontaneous symmetry breaking. If we would put a coherent pump, so what this guy is talking about is adding something like an A plus A dagger term yeah, into the Hamiltonian. Yeah, so the Hamiltonian would have such a term inside. That would mean that you cannot rotate the phase of these operators here without changing the Hamiltonian. And this property, yeah, so this is what is U1 phase rotation symmetry is present for all the other terms, including for this incoherent pump term. Yeah? So if we adhere to this uh, setting, yeah, so then I want to tell you the very basic physics of this model. We explore this in more detail. And, and that is available if you just do the simple most thing you can think of, look at a mean field theory. So then this is implemented by just looking at the expectation value of this operator here which is defined in this way. And we make a specific ansatz for this complicated many-body density matrix in terms of a spatial product yeah, over states. Yeah, think of this as a discrete space, then it's e easier. And, and, and in particular, for each of these row of axes, we assume there's a coherent state. So if we apply an operator A phi hat 
on x on such a state, phi of x, yeah, it spits out a complex number in this way. We get to that in the path integral anyways. Yeah? And if you take a simple homogeneous limit, so we make another ansatz that spatial variations, yeah, for example, caused by this term here are not important, then we end up with this simple equation here, which indeed describes the overdamped motion in a potential landscape that looks like that in the case that gamma loss minus the, the loss rate minus the pumping rate is smaller than zero. So we pump the system more uh, than, than it loses. Yeah? So that means that this minimum here becomes unstable. So for um, gamma, so this is the potential landscape here for, um, so this is phi, phi star. This is our potential landscape here for gamma loss minus gamma pumping is bigger than zero. And the picture that's on the blackboard, uh, uh, on, the, on the screen here, is the situation where it's smaller than zero. So as a function of loss minus pumping, yeah, you see actually that here is zero. When this becomes negative, yeah, a kind of condensation expectation value here develops. Yeah? And uh, spontaneously, this system chooses its complex phase. Yeah? That's a complex phase in this degree of freedom here. Um, so we have a condensation phenomenon, and that would be absent. Yeah? So in, in case we would have here this uh, pumping term. Question? No. OK, very good. So now uh, the plan is to translate the physics of this equation and even more general um, uh, driven open quantum systems from this many body master equation into a Keldish uh, functional integral. And in, yeah, so be yeah, because we have fields here. So, ah, in the room? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, um, how should I interpret this uh, phi x? Like, is it just like, you know, the operator which creates a Particle at position yeah, x, yeah, or yeah, 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 yeah. right. Yeah. So, so is it like a delta function, or um, so think of? I mean, think or, or I mean another notation: annihilation operators. Yeah. And now I'm replacing this by, yeah. So I mean, you can think of this as a system on a lattice. Yeah. And now I I just move to a continuum description here. Yeah. So these guys are really, and I put the hats yeah, when I want to emphasize the, the operator nature of this, uh, of this and also here. Yeah? Why are we choosing 5-4 theory? Like, is there any particular reason for this? That is uh, the simple most theory, yeah? so that, that hosts phenomena like phase transitions. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So imagine I would uh, leave away these quartic terms, yeah? so these 5-4 terms. I would have a quadratic theory in the moment that I have more loss than pumping, uh, more pumping than loss, the system becomes totally unstable. Yeah? So it's kind of, it's, it's in the spirit of a landau ginzburg phi to the 4 theory, the quartic interaction are the ingredient that give you stable phases of matter, but still the power of describing phase transitions. Yeah? So if you want to describe phase transitions, we need an element of non-linearity in our problem, and that's, that's how we implement here. And basically, you could also look at this problem as, so what's actually the simple most problem yeah, with phase structure, interesting phase structure, and respecting the U1 um, phase rotation symmetry, yeah, so that we can have something like spontaneous symmetry breaking. Mm -hmm. Now, there was another question, because we have fields here. Right, I think it's basically the, the, the same assumption. Yeah? You can just think, or, or the same question in a, in a, in a sense. Yeah? So these guys here, these are now, in this case, for example, the single particle losses would be these phi, phi i operators. And as I said, yeah, we replace them by operators in the, acting in the continuum. Uh, so in this sense, uh, I mean, just you, if you like, you can think about this as discrete degrees of freedom. But we, we, we work then in a, in a, in a continuum limit yeah, to, to go to a field theory description. And for the continuum limit, yeah, you can really think about uh, this, this, uh, this limit as something that we are 
in the end interested in phase transitions or in long distance properties of the problem. So you can look at this continuum description as something that we by hand coarse grain a little bit over the structure that's underlying, a, a, that, that's for example a lattice, an, an optical lattice in a coal atom system or something like that. Yeah? Okay, good. Right. So let's now move into this um, Keldish uh, functional integral uh, description. And um, yeah, let's just go for it. A little motivation for that comes actually um, from Feynman himself, the guy who invented a path integral. So why should we do a, a functional integral language? And I just read this sentence here. The formulation is mathematically equivalent to the more usual formulation, totally applies. The more usual uh, Lindblad formulation will be equivalent to that, at least if we focus on stationary states. There are, in that sense, no fundamentally new results. However, there is a pleasure in recognizing old things from a new point of view and what is maybe the most important sentence here, there are problems for which the no new point of view offers distinct advantages. Yeah? And certainly, I think it's fair to say that uh, quantum field theory, or field theory in general, yeah, problems with, with fluctuations, yeah, the, the, the good language to talk about them is, I mean, at least if you want to do some semi-analytics, is in terms of, of path integrals. Yeah? So there's very powerful techniques, uh, diagrammatic perturbation theory, collective variables renormalization group that are developed for the quantum field theory formulation of this problem, which would not be available in the Lindblad uh, description so easily. And uh, specifically now beyond um, path integrals in general, yeah, I would advocate that this Keldish functional integral is actually very close to the real-time formulation of quantum mechanics. And in this way can give you a unified view on principles and mechanisms, for example, how do symmetries work in an out-of-equilibrium se uh, setting, um, in, in now also out-of-equilibrium. And it opens the, the toolbox of quantum field theory quite in general. Okay, so let's now move to how it works. And there is basically three steps. This is an important slide, yeah? so please now um, follow carefully, and then we'll fill out the details step by step. So we can look at this Keldish functional integral in three main steps. And I pick you up yeah, where you know the, the physics. Yeah? When we have a Schrödinger equation, we should think of it, or we can think of it mathematically, as evolving a state vector. Yeah? So this is a vector here in Hilbert space, which evolves according to the Schrödinger equation. I can write it either in a differential form or I can write it in this integrated form, yeah, where the unitary operator here is just the exponentiated Hamiltonian. Now, if we move from pure states to mixed states, we have to work with the Heisenberg von Neumann equation. Yeah? So that's actually a piece that we already recognized in the Lindblad evolution. This is describing here the um, evolution of a density matrix yeah, which is more general than the Schrödinger equation because it can uh, go beyond the case where the density matrix is an outer product of two states and therefore a pure state. So this is general, the more, more general than, and than the Schrödinger equation in that it involves density matrices and, uh, and, and not state vectors. But one thing is really crucial just uh, mathematically, instead of evolving here a vector, so an index, uh, an object with one index, you can see here we are evolving really a matrix, yeah, an object with two indices. So if we want to integ integrate this equation, you see also the structure of a matrix evolution yeah, in terms of um, each of the indices of this matrix has to transform with either u or u, u dagger. And the same is actually true for the Lindblad equation. Yeah? So here we have just a little bit more um, general structure than this unitary evolution. Namely, we add here these Lindblad operators, but what is really shared with the Heisenberg evolution is that actually in each step in time, a matrix is transformed into the next updated matrix. Yeah? And this is described by this left and right action of the operators, be it this Hamiltonian or this Lindblad operators. And formally, and I'll tell you how this is meant here, because of 
because this equation is still linear in rho, yeah, we can exponentiate this and we get this so structure that is uh, very similar to, to, to the in, in, in that sense. Okay, so now let's move into, um, let's go along these three steps to construct uh, the Keldish functional integral, and I'm focusing here on, on, on bosons. Yeah? So first of all, so who is familiar with the functional integral idea? Okay, few people, but so let, let's go here uh, slowly. <laughs> um, functional integral idea is this. Yeah? We start from a state vector here at t0, and we work in this exponentiated form here. Yeah? So we throw onto uh, the, um, the wave function here the unitary e to the i h t, or e to the minus i h t, and then we discretize yeah, these time updates here into small pieces of size delta t, and um, we um, insert resolutions of coherent states to make the Hamiltonian operator actually um, algebraic. Yeah? So here in these steps here, we in insert these coherent states. Yeah? So coherent states are defined as states that are, now this A is, is the annihilation operator here, and on a coherent state, it acts uh, by uh, as an eigenvalue condition. It spits out the number phi here, complex number phi. The overlap of two coherent states is given by this formula here. And the important point that we will use here is that you can resolve the unit matrix in Hilbert space here in terms of uh, coherent states. So these are the three formulas that we need in order to path integral quantize, if you like, this um, coherent evolution here. And maybe I focus on, on one time step. If not many of you are familiar with this, I focus on, on one time step here. Um, right. So we then um, look at this time string here. And I want to look really at one time step of size uh, delta t here. Here is running delta t h, yeah, just on this short time interval of length delta t. And um, at this point here, I insert the coherent state um, by using this formula e to the um, minus, this is step number n, step number n plus 1. This. And here I insert a resolution of identity labeled with this e to the n plus 1. Like this. Yeah? And then I consider actually the matrix element that comes from this thing here, oh, together with this. And this. Okay. So let's let's clear this up. We look at the matrix element for one time step, which is it includes this factor here. This factor is counted to the next time step. Here we just have this thing. And we look, as I said, at the matrix element. Yeah, phi n from here. No. It's like that. I was one step too far. But of course, because delta t, and that's now the, the, the key point uh, of this chopping up into small pieces here, we can write this as here 1 plus i delta t h. And h, let this be yeah, for, let's say, a single degree of freedom, creation and annihilation operators. We don't have to look at now. So the construction is really can do this at every point x in, in space. So let's just look at a single degree of freedom. And this h is a function of creation and annihilation operators. And let's assume now this thing here is normal ordered. 
meaning that all creation operators are on the left and all annihilation operators are brought to the on the right. Yeah, so this you can always arrange it. You just reorder your operator products here by using a um, commutation relation for bosons. If this is the case, then with this guy, we can act on this coherent state to replace it by Hamiltonian of phi on the coherent state number n. And by normal ordering, yeah, so this A dagger acts on the coherent state in this, um, in this matrix element. So here we get this piece here. Okay. And then if we have this, yeah, now here happened the crucial step. The operator, the Hamiltonian operator, that was a function of the uh, creation and annihilation operators, now, because of the action on coherent states, becomes a function of complex numbers, the eigenvalues of this coherent state. And after we have done this step, well, we can re-exponentiate uh, this uh, 1 plus e, I, um, e delta to, um, a full, um, uh, to, the, to a full exponential, and we get here minus phi n. Let's just copy paste plus the overlap of the state phi n plus one phi n gives us is just given by the product that's here on on the board. So this gives us e to the phi n plus one star phi n, and then times one minus i h on phi n phi n. And then we can recollect the terms. I want to write it as something like E and then an I delta T. I want to pull this out. Then this term goes into minus I. Phi N. And this here, we re-exponentiate. It doesn't matter if delta t is small. We pull it, you can write it in exponential form. We pull out the delta t and we write it as minus h. And plus 1 phi n. Bracket closed. Okay? And then you can see that if we now take a temporal continuum limit here, this thing here morphs into a time derivative for this term here, we can write, anyone wants to say why this is a good approximation to not distinguish these two, uh, these two elements here? Yeah? Exactly. Yeah? So this is already... Uh, order delta t, and here I could write this as phi of t plus order delta t, so the distinction between these two is order delta t, and taken into product with this delta t is already delta t squared. So therefore, this is a, a good approximation. Yeah, and, and there's a question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I, I'm a bit confused about like this Hamiltonian and then like A dagger A, like what do you mean by this? Like, and why can we act on this, those cats? Like, Take an example. Like this. Yeah. Now, yeah. So this guy here, we, we the, the um, annihilation operator act on coherent states to extract the number, yeah, which gives me phi n. And now, a dagger. gives you this. So therefore, I mean the omega naught, I pull it out, and here I get a phi n plus 1 uh, star. Okay? Any Hamiltonian, you can write it, of course, as a sum over products of A dagger A's. And for example, if we have A dagger A times A dagger A, 
we can rearrange this yeah, using that this is 1 plus A dagger A as a normal ordered Hamiltonian in this way. So normal ordered, everyone with daggers on the left, everyone with no daggers on the right. And this you can always arrange. Yeah. Okay. In which case is th Yeah. I mean, we are now looking at the continuum approximation in time or in space. I mean, discontinuities in time, I mean, what should that be? Yeah, as a, uh, I mean, a system, I mean, also quantum mechanics is continuous in time, yeah? and um, standard quantum mechanics, so, so this is also an assumption that is, uh, that is done here. So I, I think discontinuities in time, I mean, I, I wouldn't see um, that this is a specific question to, uh, I mean, to path integral construction or not. Yeah? So in that sense, uh, I, I think, yeah. So <laughs> you can ask the question, are there discontinuous in time evolution in general physical systems? But, but it's at least not a question that's very specific to, uh, to this uh, Lindblad. Okay. Ah, uh, right, yeah, so, so that, that is, <laughs> yeah, yeah, so that's actually a fair point, yeah, so these path integrals, they are, they're subtleties, so they are not rigorously, mathematically rigorously defined as, for example, the Schrödinger equation, there's a whole functional analysis theory behind it. I mean, um, what you can do, you can always um, compute uh, Gaussian functional integrals, you can you, uh, con uh, compute them in discrete time, in discretized time, so then we make no approximations, and you can, after you did this construction, do the path integral and um, then take a continuum on time limit, and you can convince yourself in this case for sure you get the same result as if you took the continuum lim limit in time. First thing, beyond Gaussian systems, I'm not aware really of a totally secure construction yeah, and uh, one, one gauges this with, 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 with a Gaussian theory. So that's my, my take on this. Yeah. yeah. So I think this is very related to the question that was just asked in the Zoom. And it's about the cases where by not considering this underlying discretiza discretization, mm -hmm. uh, some integrals might not converge. So I just was just wondering if you could maybe comment on how like what cases would we need to keep in mind that extra phase or? Yeah, I mean, as I, as I said, I mean, the, the workhorse of, of quantum field theory is a Gaussian integral, yeah? And, and again, I mean, we are discussing now, this I want to make it clear, not specificities of uh, this uh, out of equilibrium systems, right? It concerns all path integrals share this trouble or the subtleties. And I, I can, can say that, I mean, you can take a Gaussian path integral, yeah? Compute it all uh, honestly yeah, by doing a bunch of a uh, huge bunch of integrals, co computing determinants. You can take the, the temporal continuum limit afterwards, and you convince yourself that these these limits commute for the Gaussian integral. Yeah. So, but but for interacting theories, I mean, essentially the quantum field theory is in, in the end a success story. But that there's no mathematically rigorous proof. Maybe for fermions, yeah, but I'm, I'm really not aware of something deeply axiomatic uh, yeah, on the level of rigor that you can define, for example, quantum mechanics in a continuum in the operator formalism. Yeah. More questions? Okay, good. So we did this one time step. Here is again, so to say, the logic. I wanted to go a bit slowly. And ultimately, yeah, you see, we arrive now at this um, temporal, formal temporal continuum limit. Okay, if we take then many steps, yeah, so here we just looked at one of these time steps. If we take many in a row, yeah, then we have to sum over all these dt elements here. 
that gives us a continuum and time integral. Yeah, and here we have so th this time derivative operator, which comes from the overlap of neighboring states. So that was um, really this element over there. So this, these together here, they give us the time derivative. There's actually no um, a reference now. So this, I, I did the construction essentially for a single oscillator degree of freedom, but it doesn't matter. You can take as many as you like. Um, lattice, continuum, whatever, the construction is always the same. And what I emphasize here, we have really a single set of degrees of freedom describing this vector evolution, yeah? evolution of a state vector. Okay, let's now go to the second step and look, a, look at uh, the uh, Schrödinger versus the Heisenberg von Neumann e equation. Yeah? So we said we evolve a vector here, we evolve a density matrix here, and that is most prominent or most clear when we really look here at the evolution of, um, of, of the density matrix undergoing this unitary transformation on each side. Graphically, what this means yeah, that we have now two time strings sorting out of the indices of this matrix row. One is u running this way, and the other is u dagger. Yeah? Still, of course, on each of these uh, time strings here, we can discretize um, our or trotterize our operator u or here u dagger and talk about, so to say, the update from this element to, to this element. Yeah? So what um, we are thinking about here, so it's rho naught, then this evolves until this point in time. So at this point here, we reach the state rho n, if this is time step number n. And what we now have to find out is the matrix element yeah, that map us to time step n plus 1. So we want to find rho n plus 1, which is e to the minus i delta th rho n. delta t h, yeah? and that we can again approximate as 1 minus i delta t h rho n plus i delta t rho n h plus order delta t square, which we don't care about. Yeah? So we expand this here to linear order in dt. So you can see here with this relative minus sign, this is Heisenberg commutator structure appearing, and then we can go back to the construction above to evaluate um, these matrix elements. Yeah? So we see here, in particular, we need now two sets of de degrees of freedom for each time string. And the same program is actually really true for um, this uh, Lindblad generator. So if we have this more complicated structure, it doesn't get more complicated in terms of what we have to, um, what we have to update here, we just have to update now this row n plus 1. Yeah? So this step here is replaced by delta t, the whole Lindblad operator acting on row n. Yeah? And then we can do the um, matrix element calculation on this uh, Lindblad operator, and that's actually something that I want you to do uh, for, for the exercises. Okay, and in the final step, yeah, again thinking here uh, geometrically or graphically, we want to compute something that is known as a partition function, yeah, which is nothing but the trace of rho of t evaluated at some final time t final. Yeah? And then you might ask, well, but, but this is total nonsense. We know that trace rho of t is preserved. Yeah? So for all times, it takes the value 1. And indeed, we have here one of the most complicated representations of unity. And it's actually true. Yeah? Still, this resolution of the, the number 1 yeah, is something very useful because, we, because this evolution here carries really um, information on all stages of evolution. And we uh, can extract this information 
as I will show you, by introducing sources and then we get access to all kind of correlation uh, and response functions that are in this problem. But uh, graphically what happens yeah, if we take the trace of a matrix, yeah, think row as again a matrix that we evolve in time, and we uh, um, take a trace yeah, of a matrix by um, some, some big matrix A yeah, by just gluing together yeah, so the um, matrix element, and that is uh, graphically, yeah, so we identify essentially the matrix elements at the end of, of the evolution at, at some t final. And of course, if we are interested in stationary states of this problem, we take the initial time to minus infinity and the final time to plus infinity. Then we get really information on all stages of evolution. Okay, so what is then the final result of this construction? So, and, and now I think it's, it, this is really important to recognize. Yeah, so we get in the field theory description, in this functional integral description, we recognize perfectly the Lindblad structure that we started from. Yeah? So in particular, there's a simple rule of thumb. All operators that act on the density matrix from the right, yeah, so like this row H term here, they go to this so-called minus contour, to this branch of evolution, and all operators that act from the left onto the density matrix, they go onto this uh, plus contour here. And that gives us really a simple uh, translation table yeah, where um, you can start from, uh, from, the, from the quantum master equation and immediately get a recipe, recipe for writing down the Lindblad um, action. Yeah? So this is displayed here. So th the um, labels here, and that's something that I should also uh, note in terms of the notation that we're using. We want to have um, degrees of freedom phi plus and minus, and also we have phi star plus minus. Yeah? So this thing here, we want to call it big phi, and that's what all these h plus, h minus, l plus, h minus can depend on. Yeah? So they, they exclusively depend then on one of these field types here. And recall again, these field types, yeah, they, they come really just from tracking on which side of the density matrix did this operator act on. Is this, did this become clear or? Okay, question, yeah. Absolutely, very good. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So, so again, so here is our row naught, yeah, and on this side here live the degrees of freedom um, minus, yeah, and here live the degrees of freedom plus. Okay, and that is, is gives you the the mapping into this. Um, Keldish action here. Now, there's one caveat, yeah, uh, which have to do with the ordering of these operators. That's something, I mean, if you're interested, I, I can give you more details on that, but um, let's not um, break the flow with this. Uh, important technical detail, though. Okay, good. So let, let's now move a little bit into uh, structural properties of this uh, Keldish functional integral. Um, that I wrote down here again, and I want to focus on three aspects that reflect different levels of how we include or we deal with fluctuations. Yeah? So a path integral yeah, is, uh, is really an unraveling of the physics of the problem into many configurations. Yeah? A path, summing over these field variables here, you should think of it as summing over many conf or all possible configurations that this field can take. Yeah? And the big difference of a quantum field theory or also a statistical field theory is that not only a single field configuration matters, as we know it, say, from classical mechanics or deterministic theories more generally, they're only a single trajectory of the finger configuration of the field matters, now, what this prescription here tells you is that you have to sum over all possible 
configurations to get um, the right answer for your problem. And that, that's really quantum or statistical field theories are summing over many configurations of the field. And let's now see different layers of complexity of including or not these fluctuations. Okay? And I want to go here in three steps. The first is actually the um, how is probability conservation reflected in this functional integral language that will take us to a kind of zero order inclusion of fluctuations. Then there is a deterministic limit where really only a single configuration contributes. So that's like a, um, yeah, that's a deterministic limit of this functional integral. And then I will tell you how or what, what the interpretation of, of fluctuations is in this problem. And in the next lecture, we take a compromise where we take a specific sort of fluctuations into account in the, what is known as, as a semi-classical limit of this Keldish path integral. Okay, so there is a, yes, there's two degrees of freedom. Bec yeah, that's absolutely right. Yeah, so that's exactly the point. Yeah. If we uh, get rid with, uh, if we just evolve uh, vectors here, yeah, so then I could write down here just phi plus, phi plus star, yeah, and I, I just ignore this index. Yeah? So indeed, so the two types of field that we are encountering, they are directly really reflecting that we are evolving a matrix. Yeah? And therefore, we need an additional index, if you like. Was that, yeah. That, that's, really, that's really a crucial point. Yeah. Okay. Hmm? 15 minutes, yeah, good, yeah. Okay, so let's, let's go with this, so maybe just back to, oh, now I'm moving in the wrong. Yeah, so, so let's, nah. Let's go with this, uh, with this first step, yeah? So how is probability conservation reflected in this um, Keldish functional integral language. Okay, so just recap. Yeah? Probability conservation in Lindblad was the property that the uh, uh, time evolution of the trace of rho vanishes yeah? because of cyclicity. In the Keldish language, yeah, the same property is stated as the normalization of the Keldish partition function. So it's just unity, although we can represent this unity in very complicated, but as I will argue, useful ways. And now I want to argue that in this uh, Keldish action formalism, uh, probability conservation is reflected by the property that if we don't make now, we, we choose specific configurations of this field variable, yeah? really think of it as configurations of this field, if we identify the plus and the minus contour, so these two sides after evolution, then this Keldish action has a very special property of vanishing. And that will reflect probability conservation. Now, let's see how, how this comes about. And um, I think I'll do a little calculation for that. That has to do with a redundancy that is really built in this uh, Keldish formalism. Yeah? So, which has to do with the cyclicity of the trace. So, if you take the expectation value in the operator formalism of any operator at some point in time, I can write this either as trace of this operator with rho of t or as trace of rho with o. Yeah, this is just the cyclicity of the trace. If we now translate this into our Keldish partition function language, yeah, so here are the two branches of this. And let me now not evolve it to infinite times, but just to some finite time t. Mm -hmm. And now, these two equations here, they are implemented by putting the rho of t is the, one, is the thing that we just learned how to evolve it, how to propagate it in time under this Lindblad evolution. And now, this here corresponds to inserting the operator here on this uh, plus branch yeah, of this time evolution, this thing here corresponds to inserting it here. Yeah? So we can write, and then this operator, it acts on coherent states, yeah, and it reduces to 
into monomials of the field. Yeah? And then if we translate this into this uh, Keltish language, I can write this insertion on this side here as an insertion of the operator O on the plus contour, while this thing here, yeah, this here, I can write it as the operator inserted on the minus contour. Yeah? Now, let's take, so this is a redundancy that is built in this uh, formulation, yeah, which relates to the redundancy of, or, or to the cyclicity of the trace, if you like. Now, let's define my action, the Keldish action, as the time integral over a Lagrangian density, yeah, so small s. So that's just a, I just want to have the density in, in time of this action, yeah, which still is a functional of capital Phi plus. Yeah. And if I then, so that's just a definition that we'll need in a second. Then I can write dt yeah, of the partition function, the Keldish partition function of z, yeah, so the functional integral. This is, of course, zero. Yeah, so this is the tres preservation of the trace in this problem. And I can write this, yeah, if you look here, I take a time derivative on the action. Yeah, which runs here now up till until time t, yeah, starting from t0, which is here. Yeah. I, it acts on this here, and I get here, because I differentiate yeah, on, on the, uh, the upper time argument of this action here, I get here s, small s, this expectation value, and this has to be zero yeah? for all t. Yeah? And I, for all t and for all possible actions that I might uh, consider here. And now using this redundancy, using this relation, yeah? this is the same as phi plus. Plus. Yeah, I'm using that any time local operator here, I can exchange the index. Okay, and since this has to be valid for all times and for all possible actions, yeah, we conclude that this thing here actually must indeed be zero. Yeah, so that's the, the probability conservation um, shown in the action. Yeah, question? Um, with this constructions uh, of conservation still work if we included sources uh, into the action? Um, the source actually, that, that will come. Yeah? So a certain class of sources respects this, and another source doesn't respect this. But that's absolutely no problem. Yeah? Because the sources, I mean, they're just there to take uh, derivatives yeah? to generate correlation function and then set them to 0 in the end. Yeah? So actually, indeed, the inclusion of sources violates this. But, but there's also not, nothing wrong with that. No. Other questions? No? OK. Right. OK. So we have this um, redundancy in the Keldish formalism, yeah, which shows us that, I mean, if we evaluate this field, the, the, the action for field configurations, where we take the same configuration on either side of, um, of the, this Keldish contour here, then the action has to, be, has to vanish. And you can memorize this if you like. Yeah? So, if, so that this e identifying the indices phi plus and phi, or the fields phi plus equals phi minus, this operation is really kind of using, uh, forgetting about on which side of the contour did the uh, original operator act. So it's really the cyclicity of the trace that we are, that we are uh, seeing here, what the consequence is for, for the action. Yeah. And actually, 
I, it might seem like a little detail, but that's still the best way I see to motivate the next step. Yeah? The next step is what is known as Keldish rotation. Okay. So, and that is, I, I want to sell this to you, this Keldish rotation, you will find it in, in, in all books, essentially, as a way to make this probability conservation a little bit more handy yeah, on the level of your action. So the starting point, namely, is again the action in this uh, contour basis. So we are now doing a transformation in the space, in this two by, spa two, by two space of plus and minus fields. Yeah, so that's what makes our Keldish action special compared to, I mean, actions that you know from equilibrium problems. Yeah? So here we have, um, that's a starting point, yeah? the action formulated in this plus minus or contour basis where uh, probability conservation is expressed in this way here. And now I propose to do a, what is known as Keldish rotation, where we consider instead of phi plus phi minus, the symmetric superposition, so like a center of mass coordinate for these fields, and a relative coordinate, yeah? so which is the difference, yeah? how much do, does the field configuration on the plus and minus contour deviate from each other. Yeah? And that gives us then a, um, the action in another basis, yeah? it's called Keldish or also RAK, for retarded advanced Keldish, that's maybe we just call it Keldish basis, yeah, where, where the action that was originally formulated in plus minus is now formulated in terms of the C and Q fields. And clearly, yeah, you can see now that the, uh, the probability conservation property is now reflected in a little bit of more elegant condition, namely the vanishing of this phi Q field. That's just encoded now the probability conservation, I feel, in a more appealing way. And let's now interpret these fields, yeah, which will really come over and over again in the following parts of the lecture here. Um, we just use again this redundancy that I was pointing out, that is really the um, cyclicity of the trace operation, now applied to the insertion of one operator. If we apply this general formula, to the, the fields, yeah, to the representation of the field operator, or its expectation value, then we, we, we find this relation here. And that is the, um, um, the property that gives the name to this field. Phi C is also called a classical field in the sense that it can acquire a finite expectation value. This is the field variable that will signal condensation for us, yeah? in this sense here, the, uh, the expectation value of the field operator that indicates that the system is undergoing a condensation phenomenon will be related to the classical field expectation value here, while the quantum field cannot condense yeah? because just the expectation values of phi plus and phi minus, they will just exactly cancel each other. So this quantum field cannot condense. Are we one minute? Okay, how far can we get in one minute? Okay, maybe, maybe I, I'll do this. Right, I, I think it's, it's, this is a good, um, good thing to, to wrap up for today. Let's, um, so I've, I've just made the point, yeah, so that if we consider no fluctuations at all, yeah, so then the, the action vanishes. Let's now look at a kind of first order expansion of the total action in this variable here. And this is um, something that um, is a good ordering principle for, for this action. So is this actually a good idea to at some point expand this action to first order in the quantum field? And that's actually indeed a good idea in the presence of a macroscopic occupation of a mode. Because in that case, yeah, if we have a condensation going on, yeah, as we can have it in this Lindblad phi 4 theory, then this classical field expectation value will scale proportionally to the square root of the number of degrees in the system. Yeah? So this is the condensation phenomenon. It's a winner takes it all. All particles in the system N will essentially occupy a single mode. Yeah? So the classical field 
scales like the square root of the number of particles in the system. And if you then, so this is in momentum space, and if you go to real space, yeah, so then uh, there is a factor of volume. So this means that this classical field scales like uh, n to the zero. Conversely, the quantum field, as we've just argued, it can never condense yeah, because of this cancellation effect because of uh, th that I was arguing for. So the quantum and the classical field in the presence of a condensation, they scale differently, yeah, as you can see here. And therefore, it is um, actually justified to expand the action yeah, in terms in first power, first order of this quantum field here. Yeah, because next order quadratic in the quantum field will, re relative to this term here, scale already subleadingly because of this difference in scaling that, that we found here. And um, if we have, since we, so when this is a good, um, when this is a controlled approximation, so when we have condensation here, then we can do the functional integration over the quantum field exactly. Yeah? So this um, is the last thing that I will then do today. We have a functional integral, yeah, so over phi plus, phi minus, yeah, or alternatively, phi classical, phi quantum, yeah, of a structure e to the i, and then something like phi q such a structure here, take this as a, a proxy for this is we want to do an integral dp e i p x. Yeah? This here is linear in phi quantum. This here is a structure that is complete, might be very complicated. But what this produces for us, yeah, so it's a representation of the delta function. There is a few subtleties, which I, I'm happy to discuss, yeah, because these are now not real numbers that we are integrating. Yeah, so here, this is real, and this is also real. There's a few subtleties, but, but it's a mathematically still very simple problem to convince yourself that, indeed, yeah, this linearity in the quantum field pins you, da pins you by this Fourier transform-like formula, essentially fixes the configuration of ds d phi c to zero. And this is nothing but a classical equation of motion. Yeah? So this is an action principle that the only configuration that remains in the sum over, in the configuration sum over the classical field is the one that minimizes this classical, this action here. Yeah? So, um, in this way, yeah, so taking into account linearly the fluctuations of the quantum field, if you like, we produce precisely the deterministic limit of this Keldish functional integral. And what I um, will give you, and now we come to the exercises, I have prepared, I mean, a few pages of, or, or, well, <laughs> a few <laughs> exercises uh, written out, yeah, which guide you again through a few important steps what I feel important steps of this lecture, and one, for example, is yeah, to, to look at this equation of motion from the viewpoint of the Keldish functional integral in the deterministic limit on the one hand, and on the other hand, you can derive the very same equation as a mean field theory for, I mean, as I indicated at some point, as a mean field theory for the, um, um, for the operator expectation value uh, phi had expectation. Yeah? So, and then you can compare really how these approaches um, somehow comply with each other. Okay, so that's it uh, for today. I was a little slower, but uh, that's, I think, just fine. So I'll compress a little bit the <laughs> parts of what I wanted to say tomorrow. Thank you so much, Sebastian. Do we have other questions? Very fast one. Uh, since you said quantum fields don't condense, 
Yeah. There you are setting that the, that is uh, going uh, a leading order as n zero. Is it due to the fact that it's the square root of the modulus uh, square, something like that? Uh, that's no, no, I, I mean it, it's it's a <laughs> good point. It's a power counting argument. Yeah. So where, I mean everything that that fluctuates, I mean or or, or that has occupation of order one. Yeah. So basically nothing. Yeah. So <laughs> nothing. The point being, nothing that scales with a number, uh, with a system size. Yeah? And that's different from this condensation. Yeah? So, I mean, the, 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 the particle density of, of a condensed system scales with phi star phi okay. proportional extensively, and all other fields, yeah? so they, they don't scale at all. So, in this sense, n to the zero. It has nothing, their, their occupation has nothing to do with system size, and that's distinct. Yeah, that's Thank the you. Point. Sorry, it's probably me being dumb, but um, would you mind summarizing, like, um, you know, it's kind of like in very, you know, like on a very high level, like, you know, with all the calculations you've done? Because, yeah. like, I, I just got a little bit lost in, like, how does this fit all together? So, I understand, like, we start from, like, this um, mm -hmm. kind of like a path integral. So, like, we consider a matrix element of, like, say, having a unitary and, like, final and initial state, mm -hmm. and then like we can, you know what, and then we will end up with the path integral, right? Uh, when we do this with like this specific action, and then if we do the same thing for like density matrices, we'll have like two, those two degrees of freedom. Mm -hmm. And then like you're saying that there's a certain redundancy and like those guys because of the probability conservation. Mm -hmm. And that's why we can, you know, like perform a certain like sort of like a choice of basis, if I understand correctly, yeah. where we like set up this like quantum field to be zero. Um, and then this is like this Keldish basis or something. Mm -hmm. And then like what happens afterwards, like I kind of like... Right, yeah, so I mean, I would say you gave a perfect summary <laughs> of exactly what was done. The next step, yeah, is of course, I mean, then how to um, look at, I mean, how to extract information from this. I mean, I wanted to give you with these considerations, indeed, it's a bit... Tomorrow we'll start with this, yeah, how to extract information from this, um, from this uh, closed time contour, yeah, and it will be like we are asking now a question, okay, here I have a phi field, yeah, on this plus contour at time t, and I want to know, for example, how is this correlated with phi star at some t prime, yeah? So, and, and, and these are the, the kind of correlation functions, and, and I give you some structure of this, yeah? So, in this way, we can extract information way beyond the deterministic limit, yeah? For which all these correlations here would be exactly zero, yeah? So, we want to build this, uh, I mean, from the problem from the de around the deterministic limit, but the next step will, of course, be how to, I mean, what is the impact of fluctuations? I'm sorry, what is the deterministic limit? It's just uh, the deterministic limit is the one where um, where we expand here in the quantum no. in the quantum field to first order, where the key formula that tells you that it's really a deterministic limit. Now I'm totally confused here. So where the key step. Yeah, if, if we just take the quantum field to linear order, yeah, so then by this essentially Fourier identity over there, we find that this pins all the possible configurations to the solution of the equation of motion for a classical action. So it pins the physics of this whole problem to a single configuration, and that is, a determinist, that is the deterministic limit. Yeah? So again, think of a path integral, no matter of statistical or quantum theory, as something, yeah? so where if this is the path that minimizes the classical action, yeah? then the quantum or a path integral tells you actually this, sum, please sum, over all configurations including, of course, the one that has minimal action, but in fact, we need to take into account all other 
passes as well according to this prescription. Yeah? And now, with this deterministic limit, we were looking for an ordering principle under which physical circumstance is such an approximation yeah, of the whole problem by just its deterministic path, when is this good? Yeah? And the answer was, well, if we have, uh, for example, this, this condensation phenomenon, yeah, so that's one way to justify the semi-classical limit, because in this case, yeah, we, we have a good ordering principle, we have a good argument why we can expand this huge uh, thing here to first order in these quantum fields. And I'm, I'm sorry, why there's a different dependence maybe on n for mm -hmm. classical and quantum field? And sorry, oh, maybe, yeah. mm -hmm. maybe in the sake of time, because we have also other questions on Zoom, okay. you can discuss I, I, this I'll, offline. I'll just I'll go actually, I also suggest that tomorrow, maybe you, to answer his original question, give a short item list of the various steps of the calculation, yeah, so yeah, people can do that. have a refresh. Yeah. So, so we but I still want to answer, no? So, so very briefly. Yes? So, so, I mean, we had this redundancy here. Yeah? And um, the, in the presence of condensation, yeah? so this guy here scales like n to the one half. Yeah? However, mm -hmm. I mean, the difference yeah? is cannot scale. Yeah? Because, I mean, these the scalings will just. Uh, kill each other, but of course the, the configuration phi plus minus phi minus, that is not log to zero. Yeah, so, but <laughs> still oh, in terms of a scaling argument yeah, for the expectation values, this, this huge uh, scaling with square root of n that, that cancels out exactly. Yeah. One last question yeah. from online. So a guy is asking how you can see the coherence uh, in coupling to the BEF from the path integral language. So the question is this one, but I think I represented it. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, th that's actually, uh, I, I can give a, <laughs> I would prefer to answer this actually in the Lindblad language, <laughs> but I can tell you what this means in the, in the Keldish as well. I mean, decoherence, let's say, is the property that, um, let's take Lindblad operators yeah, that are just, um, looking at the particle number, um, density, say, yeah? and then we have this structure. We have this structure, and if L, this means that L equals L dagger, so we have to deal with Hermitian Lindblad operators, and that means actually that rho proportional unit matrix is actually a solution of this uh, Lindblad uh, generator here. Yeah? Because, I mean, I, for L equals L dagger, yeah? you can see here very nicely if I insert rho is the unit matrix, then this thing here is annihilated, so time evolution stops. And then the physics of this is, of course, that if rho is a unit matrix, this is an infinite temperature state. So here you can see the loss of any type of information, yeah, phase coherence or whatever. In a unit matrix, there's no information left. And in this sense, we see um, decoherence in the Lindblad equation. And now the question in the Keldish path integral is reduced to what is the specific features of the, um, of the Keldish action when, I mean, we, we take... Uh, Lindblad operators, path integral, quantize them. Of course, this shows up in the Keldish action as well. I'm not expecting anyone to, to follow <laughs> this argument, but um, a statement will be that the quantum fields, they have a finite coefficient with an i in front, yeah, coming from, from this Lindblad structure here, while the phi classical phi quantum component plus emission conjugate here is stands as zero. Yeah, so this is how decoherence shows, shows up in, in this um, Keldish action. All I'm saying, there is a consequence, but it's much more transparent, this property here in the, in the operator formula. I'm actually really not advocating that for any problem you should, <laughs> you should go for, for this Keldish functional integral. For many structural properties, 
the good thing is to, or a very convenient way is to think about operators. Yeah? And, um, but for many calculations, co <laughs> conversely, the path integral is, is the way to go. Yeah? So I'm, I'm certainly not a fundamentalist <laughs> about uh, you, everything has to be seen in the path integral. It's certainly true, but if it's efficient, it's, uh, that's a different question. Yeah. Good. With this piece of <laughs> philosophy, I think we can thank Sebastian again. A uh, short announcement for speakers and organizers that just arrived. If you follow me, we can store our luggages and backpacks in an office. And all of us, we convey here at 2.30. Okay? <laughs>